Good evening. I'm Maury Oaken, the president of Detroit Chamber Winds and Strings, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to tonight's Structurally Sound at Poapic Pottery, the first performance on our 40th season. Structurally Sound is a series where we select an architecturally or historically interesting space in Detroit and then challenge one of our musicians to create a program that complements that space. So tonight's presentation reflects the imagination of our wonderful flute player, Amanda Blakey. Before we begin, I wanna thank this evening's sponsors, Mary Brevard and Bevan Berry Williams for their generous support. Also, there'll be a live Q and A with the performers immediately following the performance. So please stay tuned for that. You can type questions into the chat on your screen as the concert goes on or even during the Q and A itself. Also at that time, we're raffling off a hexagonal paperweight, a gift to one of the, our attendees that's coming from Puabic Pottery. As I mentioned, DCWS is celebrating its 40th year. To celebrate our 40 and forward season, each concert will include a student of one of our musicians. Tonight you will meet Andrew Lee, a wonderful flute player who's a student of Amanda Blakey. Finally, if you'd like to support concerts like this, a new donation of $200 or more to Detroit Chamber Winds and Strings will be rewarded with a beautiful Powapic Pottery Bud Vase. Information on this can be found on our website, www.detroitchamberwinds.org. Please enjoy the performance, and I'll see you afterwards for the Q&A. Thanks. Hi, I'm Steve McBride, Executive Director of Poavic Pottery, Detroit's National Historic Landmark Pottery. Uh, we're really excited tonight to do this concert. Uh, it's a wonderful chance to showcase one of Detroit's true cultural gems. Um, I'll give you a little tour behind the scenes. You'll learn a little bit more about our history and about you know, how we make the work that we make. Uh, Poavic started, it was founded in 1903. So just to put that in context, that's the same year as Ford Motor Company. So when we started out, you know, most of our customers were arriving by horse and buggy. And one of the really cool things about Detroit is there's been this parallel track. Um, Detroit's known, of course, for the founding of the assembly line and industrialization. But at the same time, it was also one of the leading centers for the arts and crafts movement in America. And this really grew up together. And when Plavik was founded, it was founded by two people. Uh, the leading artistic force was Mary Chase Perry, who was born in 1867 up in Hancock in the Upper Peninsula. She moved down to Detroit as a young child and you know, grew up down here and became a, a pretty prominent China painter. So she would teach workshops, um, sell work, uh, do some writing about that. It was, was pretty prominent in the field. And that was, China painting is painting overglaze enamels on already pre-fired porcelain. It was a pretty common activity, especially for women of the era, just around the turn of the century. The partner in this whole endeavor is Horace James Calkins. Uh, Horace was a businessman, he was a dental supplier, and he developed a line of kilns uh, called the Revelation Kiln to fire porcelain teeth, to fire dentures. He found out that his neighbor was using one of these kilns to fire her china painting, and so he thought that was a, a wonderful business opportunity. So he hired Mary to travel around the country selling his kilns. And that really turned into, blossomed into a real long-term creative partnership. Um, Mary traveled around, this was right before the turn of the century, so this had been like the late 1890s. And she would travel around to other studios all across the country, uh, China painters, studio potters, and take you know, these revelation kilns, which 
was a, a opportunity for potters and china painters to actually have a kiln in their home. It was a portable, you know, pretty versatile kiln. And she learned a lot traveling around. And at that same time, there was a real movement in arts in America where there was an effort to, to get the art making from start to finish. And so rather than china painters who would just paint on commercially made porcelain, uh, wanted to then move into the art making process. So she learned a lot about that, a lot, a lot about studio pottery, traveling around and meeting people, and came back and said to Horace, hey, do you want to start a business? Do you want to start a pottery? And he said, sure. So they officially founded, Plavik was founded in 1903 over in Brush Park in a carriage house behind the Ransom Gills house. They quickly outgrew that space. And at that point, they really didn't have um, an identity. It had gone by Miss Perry's Pottery or Revelation Pottery. And so they started looking for names. And Mary's father was a physician in the Pulavik Copper Mine up in Hancock, Michigan. So she was thinking through some names and that had a, a nostalgic ring to it. Um, it was kind of reminded her of home growing up in the Upper Peninsula. And it turned out to be really fort fortuitous because um, Pulavik is a name. It's derived from the Ojibwe term Wabik or Bulawik, which means metal. Uh, and that really started to foreshadow what would become such a key element of Pawabic's history, and that's the iridescent glaze development. Uh, Mary did a lot of experimenting with fire. She used to call it painting with fire. And uh, one of the challenges that she had is um, Charles Lang Freer was a, was a mentor and had brought back some shards of Persian pottery and challenged her to come up with this iridescent glaze. And so she did came up with a, a really creative technique. Um, and that's really what put Pawabik on the map. You just heard Strauss's The Blue Danube Waltz, which was the most popular song in 1867, the year Mary Stratton was born. Now, going on in time in 1898, Foray was the most prominent composer at the turn of the century, and he wrote the beautiful Morceau de Concord for solo flute and piano. Today, we have arranged it for two flutes and bassoon. And then after the Foray, you'll hear Joplin's The Entertainer, which I'm sure most of you know. This was written in 1907, the same year that Puabic here was built on Jefferson.
I'm standing now in our architectural tile showroom, and this is a, part, a huge part of Pilatic's legacy. It's, it's a part of what we've done and a big part of the artistic legacy that Pilatic has left in Detroit and really all across the nation. And it's also a huge part of what we still do today. Uh, we've, Pilatic got started making tile uh, early on, and the first big architectural commission was the Cathedral Church of St. Paul on Woodward Avenue. If you drive down Woodward today, you can see tile that spans over a hundred years, you know, from the Guardian Building to the DIA to the Detroit Public Library. The largest job Pollock's ever done, you know, even to this day, was the National Shrine of the Immaculate Conception in Washington, D.C. That was a job that was completed in 1930, but it took six years to complete. And it's, you know, an incredible process of, you know, our design, um, Plavik tile lines the domes, two domes of the basilica, the crypt church. Uh, there's lots of additional medallions and stations of the cross. And, you know, that kind of sacred space architecture is, a, is another big part of, you know, our artistic legacy. Uh, you can see it. Hello, my name is Jaquan Sloan, and I'm the African-American bassoon fellow with the Detroit Symphony Orchestra. The next piece you will hear on our program is Bacchianus Brasiliaris by Hector Villalobos. This was written in the 1930s when Pawabic was really thriving. Um, 
In this piece, Hector Villalobos set out to combine the styles of Bach with Brazilian folklore. Uh, this turned into nine compositions, which he entitled Bacanas Brasiliares. Villalobos is famously heard declaring that him and Bach are the only two greatest composers of all time, and I'm sure in his grave he still says the same thing. Um, Villalobos was known to combine many different forms of music, uh, Brazilian music, which has roots in Indian and African, and uh, jazz, American jazz. Uh, in this, this is number six of nine. Um, in the suite, he combines the bassoon and the flute uh, to give a more Bachian style. Um, he would have used Offenkleid, but bassoon really works more for the Bach style. Um, and I hope you guys enjoy this piece.
All right, the next piece you will hear is Billy by Jacob TV, originally for alto sax and ghetto blaster and will today be performed on bassoon and uh, with electronics. So Eleanor Fagan, uh, famously known as Billie Holiday, was a jazz swing singer who made a big impact on jazz singing and pop singing. Um, she was known for her vocal delivery and improvisational skills. Uh, Holiday started in Harlem jazz clubs and gained commercial success in the 1940s. Her most memorable performance was Strange Fruit, which was based on a poem about lynching, lynching written by school teacher uh, Abel Mirapol. Um, Jacob TV composed Billy based on Billie Holiday's voice um, from various interviews and various shows in her career. Um, Billie made a, uh, had a very unique singing voice and speaking voice and that is very prominent in this piece. So I hope you guys enjoy. Sing it. 
When Pawpuk was founded, it was at the height of the arts and crafts movement in America. And that in itself was a reaction against industrialization. And it was an effort to get back to the, the hand of the maker and the creative spirit behind work. We're finding that that's, you know, every bit as relevant today. Um, where in the past it was, you know, really a reaction against the machine age. Today it's, we're finding people are desperate for something that's not virtual, that's actually physical. And so here you can see where stuff is made. Um, we still use our 1912 clay mixer to make all of our tile clay. And so if somebody's coming to get a fireplace around, that clay is made in the same machine that was made, that was used to make the Guardian building downtown. Originally we make the clay from scratch and we'll mix that in our 1912 clay mixer uh, where it gets mixed into a liquid slip and goes underground as part of the part of the building infrastructure and then gets pumped up into our filter press uh, where the the water is forced out and that gives us uh, the tile or the clay that we can work with to press tiles we'll take that clay out of the filter press put it through a pug mill and get some logs of clay and then it'll go into our tile making process and so we'll make plaster molds by hand um, and press the tiles into the into the mold uh, then they'll get dried they'll get fired the first time which is called a bisque firing and that's to about 1800 degrees and then they'll get glazed uh, and then the glaze firing goes up to about 2300 degrees it's a hotter process to melt the glass and come up with the finished process uh, so every piece of work, whether it's a, a hand-thrown mug or a pressed tile or something goes through multiple hands, um, multiple people involved in getting the beautiful work. And so as a, as a nonprofit, we've just, we love to share not just the beautiful work, but the whole process. Up next, we have the Goodbye Sonatine for Flute and Bassoon. This was actually composed in 1961, the year Mary Stratton passed. So we're again traveling and relating our music to her life. So in 1961, there was a lot of very modern music written, but this one is more neoclassical in style, which means it's a little bit more like Mozart perhaps, or at least a little more agreeable and charming. The first movement is really jaunty and fun with a lot of dialogue between the flute and bassoon. The second movement is one of our favorites where we have these beautiful melodic lines and then some really interesting um, conversational uh, second theme. 
And then in the last movement, it's very sprightly and fun. Lots of triple tonguing in the flute, and really we have a great time performing this one. So please enjoy the goodbye sonatine. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
Here at Pulabic, we love to show off the pottery, we love to show off the process behind the work that we make. Uh, that educational process has been a key part of Pulabic from the very beginning. Mary herself was a teacher, she started out as a teacher. Uh, she would teach classes here at the pottery. Um, in the early days, Wayne State University students would study pottery here. Uh, Mary was part of the founding of the ceramics program at the University of Michigan. And of course that's continued uh, you know, is a really core component of what we do through our nonprofit years as well. It's always been a, a big part of it, um, a big part of who we are as an organization. So now our tile's been sitting in the form for a while. It started to shrink away and release from the plaster mold. So now it's just a process of flipping it upside down, knocking it out, and then you've got your raw plastic clay tile. And so this will dry now. Um, so it will fully, it'll fully dry. We'll take it then into the kiln room where it will go through its first firing, and that's a bisque firing. It's about 1,800 degrees, and that solidifies the clay. It doesn't, it doesn't totally vitrify it, so it's still porous and it'll accept the glaze. We'll take it into the glaze room after that, uh, glaze the tile. The, the clay is still porous. It'll suck up the water out of the glaze, and then we fire it to a higher temperature, about 2,300 degrees, that melts the glaze, turns it into a glass on the surface of the tile and then we'll put it into the retail store for people to come shop. All right, up next we have Philip Glass's Arabesque in Memoriam, which is an homage to Mary Stratton's passing. It's very hauntingly beautiful. It's using minimalistic music, and I 
I do believe that Philip Glass is one of the best living composers today. This also ties in because he wrote this in 1988, which is close to when I was born, but also is tying in with Puabic Pottery's first major project following Mary Stratton's passing. And that is in conjunction with the Detroit People Mover and the art murals down there. So enjoy this beautifully haunting music.
And the last thing I want to show you tonight is our outdoor market. Um, this is our courtyard, which we worked with the Project for Public Spaces a few years ago to renovate into a placemaking area. We use this for events and just as a place where people can come while they're waiting or hang out and have, um, you know, bring a lunch uh, if they're taking classes. Or it's, a, it's an area that we just use to like extend the experience. Um, but this summer we turned it into an outdoor market to, just to give more space for people to shop, uh, so you can shop both indoors and outdoors. And I really want to invite everybody, if you haven't been to Plobek, come on down. It's, it's, a, it's a wonderful, unique cultural treasure in Detroit. Um, it's part of the Detroit experience now for over 100 years. Uh, you can visit us in person. You can enjoy our outdoor summer market. Um, you can visit us online. It's just we really want to extend the invitation to be a part of Plobek. And to end our program today, we're going to end with some more electronic music, this time with flute and electronics. So the first piece you'll hear is called Color Wheels by Allison Loggins Hall, a living female black composer who has done some really amazing work. This piece was actually composed in 2013, which is just a couple years after Stephen McBride joined Puabic here. So this piece, you'll hear the lovely timbre and color of the alto flute. And following that, my student Andrew Lee will be joining me again, this time for a piece by Flutronics. And uh, this piece is called Brown Squares, which as you can imagine, both of these pieces tie in amazingly well to Puabic pottery. So please enjoy Color Wheels and Brown Squares.
How great was that? So uh, we're going to be bringing in Amanda and um, Steve and Jaquan. And, and uh, as, as they come in, I, I do want to, um, before I forget, I'll, we're going to do this little raffle. I have names in my hat here for somebody to win that tile that uh, Steve was showing us in the in the performance. So let me uh, let me pick a name here, and it's remember this is somebody named Margaret Van Van Hull. Margaret Van Hull. Uh, I, I know if you're if you're watching, um, reach out to us and, and next week, or we'll we'll reach back out to you and um, uh, go from there. So um, um, Nick, are are we having our, my colleagues come in? There we go. Hey, everybody. Amanda, when I talked to you about that, uh, I remember when we first talked about the show and I said to you, you know, go get the musicians that you want. And you came back, they said, you want, I, I want to do this with a bassoon player. <laughs> and maybe one of my <laughs> students, I thought to myself, is that possible? <laughs> so why don't you, you tell us how, you, how your imagination got us that wonderful performance? Sure. So, um, you know, originally when I helped to write the grant, um, I believe it was planned to do flute and piano outside. Um, so it was right. a completely different program of music and um, we weren't really expecting a pandemic, of course. So um, <laughs> as this kind of progressed on through time, um, it just seemed, okay, if we're going to be indoors and we can only have so many people, and I, and I did go take a tour of Quabbic with uh, my husband and baby. And it was better to see kind of the space and, and of course, just to see the fantastic, amazing uh, place that Quabbic is. So basically, um, yeah, I think I just, I wanted to include someone like Jaquan, who's our DSO fellow. And I thought that would be so cool. And there's some great rep, as you can hear, there were some really great duos that we did, the Goodbye and the Villa Lobos. So um, I kind of just went with this theme that I had taken from the grant writing, which was, let's try to take Mary Stratton's life and, and follow it through music and follow the Puabic history um, as well. So going all the way from, what was it, 1867 up to present day. Yeah, you know, I thought it worked great. It's a funny thing because usually the heavy pieces are up front and you have the really light music at the end, but that's not how this program plays itself out chronologically. Yeah. But it just it just came off really great. So thanks for bringing that to us. Before I forget, I, I, I have some other questions, but tell us a little bit about Andrew Lee. Yes, yeah, so Andrew Lee is, um, I believe he's a junior now. He's been studying with me for a couple of years now. He's one of my fabulous high school students. And uh, he's just, you know, fabulous in the sense of uh, what any teacher would want is a, a student that practices, but also practices well and does what you ask. And he's just sounds great. So I was so thrilled that you asked me to include a student and it worked out really well as I was finalizing the last couple of pieces. Um, either I was able to arrange something or find an arrangement like the Joplin, which had two flutes and bassoon. So that was a perfect, um, you know, opportunity to include another flute for that. Yeah, he sounds great. It's hard to believe he's like 17 or 16 or something. Yeah. He really sounds quite wonderful. Yeah. So, so, so Jaquan, um, Amanda mentioned about the, the DSO um, program that you're involved with as a fellow. Can you mm -hmm. give us a quick hit about that program? We've had the pleasure of working with a few of your predecessors, but tell people here about what that program is. Uh, so the African American Fellowship at the DSO uh, has been going on since 1990, I think is when it was inaugurated. And it's to, you know, bring more Black musicians into the orchestral space. If you know a lot of orchestras, there aren't a lot of Black and Brown uh, musicians on stage. And there are operations like this that the DSO does to help, you know, facilitate that. And what it does is uh, I play in a lot of the concerts that are going on. Uh, I have mock auditions, which are very important um, into helping, you know, get more people like me into orchestras. Um, getting really good at that audition is <laughs> the key. Um, and then I, I also get mentors um, and I can take lessons with any of my colleagues uh, that I sit on stage with. So it's it's been great. It's been very enriching. So how long, are you, how long do we have you? Uh, so you have me for, so the, the program is usually two years um, and they're not counting the COVID years a year. So I'm on for two more years. Yeah. Wow, that, that's a very cool year. 
It, it's a paid program. You're like a member of the orchestra now. Mm -hmm. A member of the orchestra, like you know, with all the little quotations. But yes, member of the orchestra nonetheless. I'm um, NS paid. Yes. And how did you get picked? Uh, so I had to send in a video, and that was the pre-screening portion, and it was just like you know some or bassoon orchestral excerpts, and they do um, any excerpt for uh, all the other instruments. It's kind of just a big pool. And from that large pool, I think every section listens to students and, or not students at this point, um, but some of the younger musicians and they select a few. I think this time around, they selected 10 of us to come to Detroit and they flew us out and it was behind a um, blind screen and we just had to play our excerpts and um, solo repertoire. And at the end, they told us who won. So that's how, yeah. Wow. It, very crazy time because it was uh, March, I think, 9th was when the audition was. And then we oh, all went on lockdown God. on March 10th. So it was <laughs> crazy. They were like, oh, you won the DSO position. Now we're going to go on lockdown. So, yeah, it was right. a crazy time for sure. <laughs> seen, seen a couple of years, right? <laughs> for, <Congratulations>. Yes. <laughs> right. Well, you sound great. It's, it's so great yeah. to have you here. I, I know that there's a, two, two of my friends in the DSO bassoon section retired within the last year or so. So you're going to be a busy guy, I'm presuming, right? Very busy. Busier than uh, most fellows would be since there are two people out of my section of four that are gone. So yeah, it's really exciting for me. I'm, I'm pretty excited for it. Great. Yeah. I didn't think about it. You're probably happy that they're gone, right? It gives you more opportunity. Not happy, but I, we, we <laughs> I understand that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Steve, thanks so much for making Foropic available to us. I know that you're a, a potter at heart and, and a little bit maybe more alike in that you know, I'm a, I'm a musician at heart. I retired from playing the trombone not that long, not all that long ago. Are you still making pottery? Uh, not actively. Um, you know, the, the pottery, like my position, keeps me pretty busy. Uh, you know, Plavik, I don't think people realize um, we've got 50 employees and about a $4 million. 65 old? Yeah. Um, wow. And so, you know, it's, and I find it really, you know, creatively fulfilling. I feel like I'm making pottery, even if I'm not doing the actual, like, making at the pottery, I feel like I'm involved in that creative process. So, you know, it, it hasn't been something I miss. I look forward to it. You know, eventually when I when I retire, I'll get back to making pottery. Um, I mean, you have all this all these cool toys at your disposal, but you're not playing with them. Yeah, it, it's kind of hard to explain, but it's it'd be a, kind of a distraction to focus on my own personal stuff when I'm trying to lead. You know, what I feel is the bigger vision for the pottery. Yeah, you know, I know that Amanda. I'm sure you you understand this, but. It's, it's easy to play an instrument, but it's really hard to be good. If you want to be at a really high level and, and play like Amanda and Jaquan play, you have to really commit to it. And I'm sure it's a little bit the same yeah. for pottery, right? And so once you've started to be really good at it and you don't have the time to be really good at it, that's really frustrating. That's right? a challenge, yeah. Yeah. Somebody, one of, one of my, my friends, uh, my former colleague, Ann Ruffley, sent in a question uh, asking about what's the most popular piece what what at at Fwaba, What's the piece that everybody comes in and says, "This is what I want." Uh, I mean, lately, one of our most popular pieces is that hex paperweight tile, the one that that we showed off that you're giving away is the drawing. Um, that's just been like phenomenal. We launched it a little over a year ago, and it's been you know one of our most popular pieces since. But um, we have a, a ton of you know really people love the you know our our classic mugs and uh, bases and. A lot of our Detroit, some you know, our Detroit tiles and things. And and did you stay open the whole time? Uh, well, the pottery was closed when the shutdown first happened. We had about eight weeks when we were fully closed. Um, I I was at the pottery every day, but I was about the only one. We had you know, yeah. furloughed most of the staff, and our designers, design team, were able to meet with clients. Um, virtually via Zoom, but for the most part, we weren't able to make anything for about eight weeks. Um, but we were able to get back in. Luckily, you know, you saw the one section in there in our new tile studio. We had just completed a 2,500 square foot addition to the pottery wow. um, to expand our tile studio. And without that, w there's no way we would have been able to like get back to actually working and have the the distance and the space. space. Yeah. So that was just a, a remarkable like time, you know, effort of timing there where that worked out. And once we were able like, to get back to work, we had you know, still had a lot of a big backlog of work to make. And so it took a while to, to catch up. Um, and the store was was closed a little bit longer. Uh, retail was at a longer shutdown here in Michigan. And then, but we have, you know, great support. We have a lot of um, 
individual donors and, and foundations and the government support. And then our um, online sales have just exploded. And oh, cool. Is most of, your, hmm? most of your business commissions? Uh, our architectural tile is. That's all custom made. And that's another area that just is exploded since COVID. And I think as people were spending so much time at home and looking at their walls thinking, okay, mm -hmm. I, I think, you know, we need a Plavik fireplace. Or like, <laughs> yeah. So, so, so has, you know, increased by 50%. So it's, it's been a, an interesting year, stressful and challenging, but um, the pottery is going great. No, that's great. So raise your hand if you're on this call and you have a Pulavic fireplace, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> when we when we first met, when Steve and Amanda met one another, Amanda showed off her, her home here in Ghost Point, which has a beautiful uh, Pulavic fireplace for us. Uh, Amanda, so you, you mentioned about this moving indoors and, and the grant. So to be clear, it was a grant from the National Endowment for the Arts that got this going. And it seemed kind of counterintuitive that we moved indoors the, during the pandemic, but the problem is the space outside wasn't big enough for the number of people that we saw it would attend. And in fact, we had 250 people register to come to this concert. So that's why it ended up doing that. But I wondered for you how much different it is to be doing this, to watch yourself being doing this, to record this, as opposed to if, if we were all there tonight, how, how different does it feel to you? Is it more pressure? Is it less pressure? Is it? It's, it's completely, it's really interesting watching it through. Um, you know, it's really fabulous to see this whole production because obviously you can see clips of, of, of everything from Mary Stratton to the pottery making to just the musicians. So um, as, as a musician myself, you know, I think it's actually sometimes more pressure <laughs> because you have yeah. about three cameras right there. You've got lots of bright lights. You have, you know, you have a sort of a set time window in which to get it all done. Um, and you don't want to mess up, you know, and you don't want to mess up in a live concert either, but you know, you want it to yeah. be as perfect as possible. And I think sometimes recording is harder in the sense that you can see the mistake again and again. So it's a little <laughs> bit more <laughs> on that way. I think when there's a live audience and the thing that I certainly have missed through the, the last year and a half, um, is, is just sort of the energy, you know, you see yeah. a, a lot of amazing people that, always support these concerts and you feel their interest their smiles they're genuinely excited to be there when you talk a little bit about each piece in between you feel like you're really connecting with them and it makes you very excited to to share it so i think it's easier to to, to forget about the perfectionism in a way um and to just love it and enjoy it and share it um certainly you know sometimes that's that's better because you kind of just have fun <laughs> but this was really fun too and just in a very different way so i tried to prepare so well knowing that it can sometimes be see a little more intense with all of the production the lights and the cameras and everything has it, has it gotten easier for you as the pandemic's gone on yeah i think so I think at the start of it it was just like oh my gosh you know i have to i remember doing some dso projects you know and i had to retake certain things just over and over and over and over again because it it just, you know, you're never really satisfied until you just start yeah. to get used to it, I think. So, um, uh, but I I really enjoyed doing this. I think it was such a cool, you know, this, this whole video basically was a, a piece of art in itself, just the way it was done. So props to all of the, uh, this, the everyone who, you know, filmed and did the audio and, and the editing and, you know, it's just fabulous. So. Boy, yeah, thanks. Yeah. Thanks so much. I know my colleagues worked really hard at it, so they I'm did. sure they appreciate your support. Right. Jaquan, I'm going to ask you one last question because I know we're going to run out of time. But one of the things that made me smile in your bio is where you said you found the bassoon at age 15. And I'm wondering what that meant. Like, Eureka, there's a bassoon here. Of course, to me, <laughs> I'm sorry, I, excuse my my age, but to me, that could have, when I look at you, I feel like that could have been like two years ago, but I know you couldn't have gotten that good that fast. So. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for the compliment. Uh, <laughs> so, um, you know, when I was uh, around 12, um, that's when we started band in middle school. And before I'd started and had to take the test, they had some kind of a hearing exam to make sure you knew what pitch was. Uh, my mom was like, oh, I did band, you should do band, it's great. And I was already like gung-ho about it. Um, and she was like, I played the bassoon a long time ago, blah, 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 blah. I pushed that aside. I wanted to do percussion. So I didn't even hear that. So I started on percussion 
and then eventually like to, at ninth grade um i became the instrumental librarian so i would watch over the instruments um that was their mistake because i would go and take some of the instruments home and just learn them um because i was bored and that's how i found the bassoon um and it was interesting enough the bassoon that i brought home was actually the instrument that my mom played when she was in high school all oh those years gosh. they like had so many bassoons from years ago but they yeah that was the only, like one of the few working ones but yeah I, I brought it and opened it up and i was like mom look she's like that's my bassoon and it had a crack on the top of it and that's how she knew it was hers and i started learning then and the rest is history because i loved that thing um, so you must have got good fast right i mean that's late to be starting a, a woodwind instrument <laughs> It was pretty late and my mom thought so too. So for the first month of me like trying to figure out if I wanted to play it, she was like, I'm not gonna buy you a reed until I know for sure that you can dedicate the time that it takes. Cause I could, she couldn't herself. So she was like, unless, it, like if you really like it, then I'll buy you a reed. So for a month I was just doing scales on the vocal, which makes, it makes no sound. So, but I was really into it. I loved it from then. And she was like, I see a fire in you, I'll buy you a reed. And that, the read she bought me, uh, like started the inferno of me, like here today. So yeah. Wow, that's an important read. I'm happy she bought it for you. Yes, so I, very I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna draw to a close with a little bit of advertising. We have a couple more concerts coming up that we're gonna invite everybody to come to. Our first live concert in quite a while is on November seventh that we're doing at Birmingham Unitarian Church, and we're doing another one of these structurally sound concerts live on November twenty first at. Uh, um, the Redford Theater with the saxophonist Tim McAllister. Information about that's on our website, DetroitChamberWinds.org. I hope you'll come and join us for those. We'll be doing all the precautions that we need to be doing and hopefully enjoying great music. Sorry, my new headphones aren't working so great. And uh, to say thanks to Steve for making Poabic available to us and to thanks for Jaquan for playing so beautifully and Amanda for lending us your chops and your imagination and um, putting together such a wonderful program. So. Thanks so much to everybody, and uh, we'll look forward to seeing you at our next concert. Good night.